everybody. Welcome to this episode of Think Business Exclusives, Getting to the Soul of Business, where we get a little bit deeper than we do my noon lives that we do um, throughout the week. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking with Marcus McGrew. Marcus, it's great to see you. We met the other day because Michael Knight in my Coffee with John series had you on and your story. I thought it was so inspiring. It was worth um, expanding on because uh, I was inspired and I know uh, it will inspire many people, but I want to give a quick background on you as we begin to dive in. Um, you're the son of an American South uh, of the American South and the youngest of two sons whose loving parents came of age at the height of the civil rights movement. You hold two degrees, a BBA in finance from the Mitchell College of Business at the University of South Alabama um, and Broad Executive MBA in integrative management from Michigan State um, University. Uh, you have worked in academia and philanthropy for two decades, helping people get to higher ground in life. More importantly, um, you're immensely grateful that in 2020, Henry Ford's uh, double organ heart and kidney transplant um, was success and you're living a healthy, just great life. Um, something you shared with me, the following quote summarizes your desire to be um, to be a blessing if I can be if I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, thank you for um, for that bio, I loved it. Uh, there's so many places I wanna start, and when we first met a couple of days ago, we were talking about your health, but I really wanna kind of dive into, first, when I hear this, um, when you talk about helping people get to a higher ground in life, right? What does what does that mean? As a business coach, I'm all about getting people to their highest potential. And so what do you, this is a two-part question. What do you do to get people to a higher ground in life? And what is it in your soul that, that fuels you to want to do that? Yeah. Well, thanks for having me back, John. It's truly yeah. a pleasure to be with you today. So as I think about getting to higher ground in life, um, it is mostly a matter of access to opportunity. So it might be um, somewhat awkward for you know folks to believe that you know access and opportunity is something that is freely available to um, to all. And uh, it's uh, not exactly the case. Yeah. So some people um, are very much aware of these wonderful opportunities um, and are challenged given the conditions in which they live to um, go about accessing those opportunities. So when I worked in academia at the seventh largest multi-campus community college district, uh, located in the heart of Detroit, uh, much of my work was about, you know, administrating or administering um, many very functions within the administration and finance wing. Uh, but beyond that, I had an opportunity to really meet and speak with, um, you know, students and parents coming from a uh, low income background um, who hadn't, frankly, had a lot of exposure yeah to what higher education could do for them and so for me my role in terms of helping people get to higher ground is uh serving as somewhat of an intermediary between um opportunity and helping those who are seeking higher ground access that opportunity yeah let's talk about that a little bit more when it comes to access and opportunity what's the responsibility of people who were born into access and opportunity or whose path is easier to get access and opportunity to turn around and help someone who doesn't have the access yeah. and opportunity. I mean, and I ask that as, you know, and on many levels, one from a raising awareness, right? Because I think just talking about it, maybe people who are of means and access and opportunity, they may not be thinking about it, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so one, I appreciate the topic. And two, um, as we begin to wake people up, what can they now do? Yeah, great question. You know, I think privilege is sometimes painted with a very narrow brush. 
Um, but I like to think of privilege in terms of how it can be used for good yeah. and how it can be used to help maximize someone else's life. I think if you consider uh, the circumstances, the conditions which make philanthropy, which make uh, charity be charity possible and necessary, it will really help change your perspective. Yeah. Um, there's a reason why uh, different supports are needed. A social net is needed for for many people. There are conditions that create and not only create, but sort of in, in some ways perpetuate uh, conditions which leaves people um, lacking. Uh, I'd say some of the, the, the basics, um, some of life's most fundamental um, things. And so I think, you know, one of the spaces I worked in, philanthropy is, is all about, you know, leveraging, um, even exploiting uh, privilege, well-endowed organizations uh, for good to, you know, again, help uh, people who uh, may be in some of the most humble circumstances, get to higher ground, show them that there is a way out. And yeah. the other thing I'd say about privilege is um, it's easy to sort of parachute into a city or a community where resources are scarce and come with all of your preconce preconceived notions and answers about how best to solve someone's problem. I think the most important thing one uh, who is privileged can do is listen. Yeah. Listen to the people who, you know, endure these circumstances every single day because they probably know or have some really good ideas about how to change things. Yeah. Yeah, that's such simple, simple advice. It's complicated. You know, sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you get on these boards and everyone's making decisions and talking about what we need to do, but they're not the ones in need. Right? Yeah. They're not. It's like sometimes, you know, the, the board has to talk to the board, has to talk to the board to clear things for the board, to make a decision for the board, right? Or the committee and the committee. But nobody sometimes, I think a lot of um, philanthropic nonprofits sometimes run into that obstacle where mm -hmm. they forget to actually talk to and listen to the people that they're helping. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I remember, um, you know, hearing a story about um, Sam Walton. This, has, this isn't philanthropy, but he would um, go from the boardroom where they would give him, you know, all of this data of what, you know, how they should be growing Walmart. And then the story goes that he would go to the diner and have uh, coffee and pie with his with his with his um, customers. Mm -hmm. And then he would come back and he would say, OK, we're filtering out everything that's not important to the customer, because mm -hmm. what he recognized was that no one in that boardroom was actually the customer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. and so I just want to kind of put it in business terms. So, so, so having um, that ability to say, okay, what committee is going to go out and constantly talk to the people we are serving, ask them questions, and just to get to your point, listen. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. That's that's what will work. So, um, so I love that. I love that. Um, let's rewind a little bit, Marcus. Yeah. Um, let's, let's rewind, um, to a time, um, you know, when you were a kid and many of the things that your parents taught you, let's go kind of, let's start before, you know, 10 years old, if you will. So you have uh, a brother, loving parents, uh, as you described, came of age in the height of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I'm the... You know, youngest of two sons um, who had the privilege of, you know, growing up um, in a home, in a family where my parents were uh, married 28 years before my father's really early death at 50. I am sorry um, to hear that. Yeah, thank that's you. Very, that's very young. I'm going to be 50 this year. I mean, you don't realize how young that is until you're yeah. that age. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So, yeah, I really appreciate it, John. Yeah. There are so many. My mom passed away when she was 51. Wow. And, and yeah. I remember I was I was um, 25 at the time. And to me, it felt old. I mean, at the time, I felt like mm -hmm. I got a life, a lot of life with her. 
But yeah. in in hindsight, the older I got, especially now that I'm 50, it's 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 hard to even comprehend. Yeah. 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 You know, there are so many wonderful takeaways that my parents, you know, uh, blessed me with. Uh, you know, top of the list definitely sort of centers work ethic. Yeah. Um, you know, you can have whatever you desire. I didn't uh, grow up in a home where my parents said you can't do something. Uh, it was the exact opposite. Like my father, um, who dropped out of high school before his senior year, like preached college to me. And yeah. whenever his friends from the Midwest would visit um, the South, Alabama in particular, he would always introduce me as his youngest son who was going to college. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah. So work ethic, integrity, you know, um, I grew up in a place in a very small community where your word was uh, and should still be your bond. Um, I mean, that is very much how uh, the community I grew up um, in still works. Uh, very close knit. Everybody knows everyone. Um, only one um, uh, violent act uh, happened in our community to date. And that, that violent act was committed by an outsider who came in the community. Yeah. Um, it is, it is family. Um, you know, everyone's connected in some way. And, you know, my first um, experience with philanthropy happened in the community where I grew up, but we didn't call it philanthropy. We just, you know, refer to it as being a good brother, sister's keeper. Right. Um, you know, being a good neighbor yeah. is, is what it meant. So I would say that I certainly learned um, how to embrace people um, and, and people of all uh, various backgrounds. And um, I learned to organize and bring people together. I would say my mom was a community organizer before the title became in vogue. Um, she was always organizing something to help someone in need. Uh, you know, organizing a trip to make certain that, you know, um, kids in my community were at least able to experience uh, different states um, during their summer breaks. And, um, you know, she enjoyed that work, um, doesn't do it as much anymore, but she is like this um, uh, one woman um, organizer of all things, fresh fruits and vegetables um, yeah. now. So right. he's still very active at 76. And um, right. so work ethic, faith, um, family, um, all very important takeaways and things that still center me today. Yeah. What is philanthropy? Let's talk about philanthropy for a minute. And what does philanthropy look like today? I think it's so different, you know, and I think um, Obama's campaign kind of really showcased that in many, many ways mm -hmm. that, you know, utilizing social media, um, that people could give a little, make a big impact and be part of the big, you know, I think the, there's still that energy around philanthropy that, you know, um, when I, when I, when I'm older and I'm 60, 70, 80, I'll give away X amount of dollars. And, mm -hmm. but really philanthropy, if you reverse engineer it, you can be philanthropic every day of your life, it doesn't mean you have to give away a lot of money. In today's world, you can give $5 to a GoFundMe. Mm -hmm. You can give, um, you know, buy someone a cup of coffee. I mean, there's philanthropy, I think, has has um, evolved the, the definition, but I still think there's an elitist energy around the word. And, yeah. so, um, and so kind of um, chat about that for a minute on how people, yeah. can, I think, begin to connect around the word. And mm -hmm. where it's more of kind of the the everyday person's philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when most people hear philanthropy, uh, a few will understand and know what it is. Others will be completely befuddled by it. Um, and, you know, there are some who associate charity with philanthropy. That is true in a sense. Yeah. In my opinion, from my perspective, I'll, I'll start with what philanthropy isn't. So yeah. philanthropy is not charity. I believe charity is informed by pity and pity uh, is not something that people who um, have and might benefit from uh, from philanthropy needs. Right. 
Uh, they don't need pity. They, they, I'm sure, uh, dealt with that um, uh, a great deal. So, for well, I don't think I just want to say this because I, I don't yeah. think I think that's a that's a great mindset. Whether you know that that anytime you give, I think you have to check yourself and give mm-hmm. and give with a clean and positive, loving heart with intent of just giving, right? Because I agree with you. I think the the pity element of it is is it, it comes from I, I'm, I'm making some uh, some broad stroke assumptions right now from you know from from the sadness from the you know yeah. the, from the fear of of being that you know from from so many elements of it. But I think you know I interviewed Veronica Scott from the Empowerment Plan. Do you know mm-hmm. Veronica? Um, from the Empowerment Plan. So it's a nonprofit uh, downtown where she makes um, jackets that turn into sleeping bags for homeless people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's, a, she's incredible. She has an incredible company. But I remember I was talking to her about, um, she was saying many times when people give to homeless people, they won't look them in the eyes. Yeah. And and it's to to your point, right? It's that mm-hmm. kind of that that pity that oh. this... And I was guilty of it when she said it. It really like sometimes like I'm so sad or I feel like I don't want to. But really, it's about me. And so now when I'm in that situation, I do make it a point to look people in the eyes because I think that is then then I have to work on what I have to work on to make sure that I'm not doing it from a place Mm -hmm. of that any negative Mm -hmm. emotion. So Mm -hmm. I just wanted to highlight, I think it's really, really important that people get in alignment with positive intent yeah and it's about change philanthropy is about change it is about social change trying to address the conditions which make philanthropy possible is i think the true essence of philanthropy um i would also add that in some ways philanthropy is also um a redistribution of wealth if you consider the many very ways in which uh, some of the the wealthy icons in American history amassed their wealth, they didn't, you know, they amassed their wealth uh, in many cases through ill-gotten gains. And the people who helped create that wealth for those icons are now, very interestingly, on the receiving end of, you know, these empires that they helped, um, helped to build. Yeah, uh, it's 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 really interesting. I I do think that you know when um, philanthropy is entrusted into the right hands and and brilliant minds who understand that it's not an exercise of pity, um, they they get it right. They yeah. actually value the voice of um, communities. They actually have genuine proximity to the people and the issues that they're seeking to help solve. Um, and philanthropy is big, there's a lot of wealth there, but it pales in comparison to government. So I think philanthropy is a really great place to sort of seed and test different initiatives, um, but it ultimately needs the support of, of government to, um, uh, to really move things forward and make certain that it is implemented and a benefit to, um, uh, to the masses. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. And you're starting a new venture in philanthropy shortly. Yeah. yeah. So tell I, me about um, that. So, you know, after a um, an arduous faith-filled journey from sickness to health, I will uh, resume my career in philanthropy at the um, William and Flora uh, Hewlett Foundation in Menlo Park, California. I'm excited about this opportunity for a number of reasons. I like it uh, first and foremost because the organization uh, works in a global capacity. So the work of the Hewlett Foundation is all about, um, you know, what it can do to help promote a better world. Um, It's a newer philanthropy. It was founded in 1966. And if you're familiar with um, Hewlett Packard, it is the Hewlett side of of that organization. And uh, it is a private foundation with some no family involvement on its, its board of trustees, but I am incredibly excited, uh, John. Most people who, you know, experience double organ transplant and a, a third major surgery um, only hope to be in a position where they can resume their work. Yeah. Um, I, I'd say um, 
you know, many aren't as, as fortunate as I am. So I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that yeah. um, I get to resume my career in philanthropy. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm also grateful for you, you know, and this is after serving almost 11 years at the Kresge foundation. Yeah. Where you were, you know, you had multiple, you know, director of program operations and information management and director of grants management um, and co-chair Michigan forum for African-Americans in philanthropy. I mean, your, your life is really built around philanthropy. And I know you talked about your parents and some of the things that they instilled in you, but what is it that you think, you know, in many ways, I think we all kind of teach our pain or pick careers. Mm-hmm. Like when we're, when I think when we're in full alignment of something we love, we're yeah. in a way teaching our pain, right? That we have been able to turn into something positive. Mm-hmm. And so does, what, does that resonate with you? And if yes, tell me. Yeah, it absolutely um, uh, resonates with me. Um, I think when you have had to start from the bottom, the very bottom, and work your way up, you can empathize um, quite easily with folks who are on a very similar trajectory. Yeah. Um, I've had many of those experiences. I, I didn't grow up with um, a silver spoon in my mouth, but I am very quick to make the distinction between material wealth and possessions and the wealth that I received to grow up in a loving family, um, to grow up with 37 first cousins, to grow up with community and genuine relationships in close proximity to my grandparents where my first cousins and I met for breakfast every morning before heading off to school. Um, you know, those are things that I will always uh, cherish. Right, yeah. Those memories, you know, uh, can't be replaced. Um, you know, organic and veganism and all the other things are so popular now. But, you know, during that time, I was, you know, everything uh, at the breakfast table was uh, uh, almost grown by my grandfather. Wow. Um, we knew exactly what was going into our bodies. And um, just that love every morning, John, felt like an exercise of uh, nutrition and affirmation yeah. and quality time with uh, my grandparents. Yeah. How I love that. I, I uh, yeah, that just is, uh, you know, my parents always raised me to never be jealous. And, uh, yeah. and, and I don't think I have a jealous bone in my body. I'm happy for everybody. But when I hear stuff like that, um, and uh, you know, it's like it, that's that's enviable. You know, it just <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it just sounds so amazing. It sounds so amazing. How much do you think all of that had to do with your recovery, which we're going to get to in a minute, with mm-hmm. your healing and recovery when it came to your double organ, you know, your heart and tr- uh, kidney transplant? You know, as far as the healing that you, you know, taking care of your body and not even, you know, just by because of where, you know, how the because of the circumstance and just mm-hmm. the energy of every all of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it definitely played a, a major role in my healing. In fact, you know, my mom, who still lives in Alabama, was very eager to uh, be be with me in, in, in Michigan during, you know, uh, 54 consecutive days in the hospital. Well, at the time, our state was suffering from some of the highest uh, new cases of COVID. And I said, you know, uh, mom, it's not a great idea. I have complete faith that, you know, everything is going to be perfectly fine. Um, I said, and because I have faith, um, and I believe that, you know, the other side of this journey is going to be um, better, I'll be stronger. Um, I'll have more to share with people about how to overcome yeah. what seems like an insurmountable odd. And so she agreed, and I said, "Please let me get well, let me recover, and then yeah. I'll come to you." And That's so August of last year, I drove home to Alabama from Michigan alone, um, and uh, saw my mom, and then you know made the drive back. It was a really good test of my stamina and. Um, It was really exciting, but to be more explicit about um, how my upbringing helped me recover, uh, you know, faith has always been a 
uh, a central uh, component of, of my life, of my family's life. And I've always turned to my faith. I happen to believe and respect where other people are on the, the faith spectrum. Um, even if they are, you know, non-believers, they don't subscribe to yeah. anything other than themselves. Um, for me, I just believe that there's a high, higher power. Um, when I think about the complexities and the nuances of the human body and so many other things, the, the beauty that we see and experience in nature, um, I tend to believe that there there is something higher working in in my favor. And so yeah. that belief and leaning into it, uh, when I was um, you know in in hospital, uh, was definitely a guiding light for me. Yeah, um, it was the reason, the sole reason why I was so confident. Yeah, that I would come out of that experience um, a better human being. Yeah. Well, what what great mindset. Before I move into your health a little bit more, I, I do want to talk about, you know, um, so you were, um, were you born and raised in Alabama? I was. Okay. Yeah. So, so I would like to know, you know, what it was like being in Alabama, because when you talk about the height of the civil rights movement, um, are you talking about um, like the mid 60s? Yeah. So yeah. my parents came of age during that time. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so what was that like being in Alabama during all of those, um, you know, during that time? Yeah. So for me, I didn't feel, um, I'd say, the same intensity of, of pressure my parents felt, you know, because I was I was born in the, the mid 70s, 75 to be exact. I'm, I'm 46. Um, but you know, think about my parents. Um, both born in 45. Uh -huh. And so when you think about... They're 20 um, years old, right? And yeah. the 1965, um, you know, Selma, you know, marches, things that, right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Civil Rights Act, Voting um, Act, you know, all of these things were, um, you know, were, were happening during their very young adulthood, you know, yeah. essentially just crossing that threshold uh, from adolescence into adulthood. And, you know, I've, I've started to like um, have um, conversations with my mom about what it was like for them. And, you know, she shares stories of them, um, you know, picketing for some of the basic uh, rights. Um, at times, she shares stories of, um, you know, taking my um, oldest first cousin, Melissa, um, to church to hear Dr. King speak in person. Um, and, you know, one of my takeaways from that, John, is, you know, just like any other area of life, if you hold this conviction that it is possible to overcome, to conquer, and uh, come out on the other side victorious, then that will help you push through um, yeah. things that are labeled hard, that are labeled difficult yeah. um, because you actually program your mind, your psyche to think that it is possible. And if you start there, you know, everything else will follow. Yeah. Your yeah. actions, your behaviors will operate like they know and believe uh, what you're affirming. What you're affirming is possibility. It's possible. Good. And, you know, that is um, that really is how you know, I strive to live my life these days. You know, we're, I think, um, you know, because we, uh, you know, see so much on social media, um, you know, depending on your level of maturity, you might actually believe everything you see on social media. You might see a post on Instagram. And if you're a young person, especially, uh, especially a young teenage girl, as research shows, you know, what you see on social media can be very debilitating because you don't see it as an ad that is, you know, um, being sponsored by a company or much of what you see in the ad isn't owned, is actually rented to paint this right. picture that I'm living a really great life filled with material possessions. And you will think yeah. that that is your route to happiness when everything that you need around you, family, friendship, joy uh you have um 
you don't have really um, may have some minor concerns that you're working through, but that is wealth. Yeah, that is, that is wealth that will help you endure. Yeah. Um, versus, you know, a, a material possession here and there that will will soon fade with time. Yeah, they sure do. They sure do. You, you know, it's like, and the older, I'm maybe 50 this year, and, and um, you know, all the material things I bought in my 20s and 30s, they, they really have, they mean nothing to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the, and the older you get, the more loved ones you lose, or, you know, my father, my mother, my mother, you know, it's like, it's like you, if, if you get to, and you watch your kids get older and yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I agree with you yeah. on that. Let's yeah. talk about health. Let's talk about health. Your your mindset and your attitude is so positive, and I love the space uh, that you're creating for everybody who is listening right now. Um, and so let's talk about you know the so so in 2020, which um, what year, what month 2020? November 20th and 21st, right. 2020. So, so when you probably couldn't even get a bed in a hospital, right, in March 2020 because of COVID, you find out you need to get a heart and kidney transplant. Yes. Okay. So that must, that's probably terrifying on a normal day, let alone when hospitals are, you know, covered in COVID. And so mm -hmm. your mindset must have really even gone into overdrive for you, Marcus. You know I mean? <laughs> and so, you know, tell us that that journey, because what amazed me is when I interviewed with Michael Knight, who owns Art of Strength, yeah, his workouts, I've done them. I mean, they're they're in. <laughs> you know, yeah, what I mean? yeah. like, I mean, you know, you're you're the kettlebells and the Turkish get ups. And I mean, they are not for the the weak or the weak minded. Right. You And so but what amazed me is, is like you just you don't talk or look like someone who's right out of kind of this, you know, heart and kidney transplant world. So how, just tell us about that journey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the journey began before November, 2020. In fact, um, before being hospitalized, I was driving myself to and from dialysis four days a week. Um, I had a dialysis catheter here. Um, on my left, I had a defibrillator, um, and I never looked or embraced the sick mentality. In fact, when I told my former, um, the, the former chancellor of uh, Wayne County Community College District, Dr. Ivory, who is um, still a very trusted mentor and friend to me, that I was sick, and the first thing he said was, you look like the picture of health. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way you could be ill. And I was like, well, Dr. Ivory, I, I am ill. And, you know, the severity of my illness is, is, you know, chronic. I had congestive heart failure and polycystic kidney disease. And so I'll never forget, I was at dialysis um, Friday for my typical uh, three to four hour session. Um, and during dialysis, my heart rate spiked and my blood pressure, um, took a nosedive. And so, um, the doctor there, uh, reached out to my, um, you know, transplant cardiologist and had a discussion and she said, I think you should go to the hospital. And I did. And I went in Friday, October 19th. And I didn't um, come out until December 1st. Uh, during that time um, in hospital, I was immobile for 38 days because I had a balloon pump um, in either of my legs, helping my heart, uh, you know, disperse blood throughout my body. Um, I woke up uh, several mornings, sometimes at 5 a.m. or a little before uh, to uh, dialysis treatment and um, you know, technicians standing outside of my door, coming in to give me, uh, uh, to administer a daily chest x-ray. Um, and I waited, um, waited patiently. You know, my doctors would round every day and, um, you know, I was always positive. My doctors complimented me on my attitude and my very positive, optimistic outlook. 
And I learned that, you know, when you're on the, the transplant list, you may not necessarily get a visit every day because, you know, your state of mind may not be there. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's custom for each patient. Um, I never lost hope. Um, my faith never waned in any way. And, you know, at one point, uh, the lead transplant cardiologist, Dr. Celeste Williams, um, uh, who, by the way, leads the largest heart transplant program in the state of Michigan, you know, we, we had a very serious talk about, um, uh, you know, my, um, my, my weight. Um, you know, it, I will say it's very easy to become discouraged mm -hmm. when you're waiting for vital organs, um, you know, waiting to receive vital organs that your, your life might continue. And, you know, we had a discussion one day and, and I frankly said to her, um, I'm not leaving until I get what I came for. Um, I, I had this, this very strong sense when I went in, John, that I would definitely receive the vital organs that I needed. Yeah. Um, and that I would be um, in much better health uh, after all of the treatment, the recoveries that, that I've been through. Um, I want to say that I have felt completely favored during this journey. My medical team at Henry Ford um, was and, and still is exceptional. I feel like almost everyone there knows my case. Because um, there was, you know, something about it that was just sort of unbelievable. Yeah. The size of my native kidneys um, before they were removed from my body were almost, weighed almost 20 pounds. Wow. Uh, due to polycystic kidney disease. My father had polycystic kidney disease. And it is a hereditary um, autoimmune deficiency um, disease that can... Uh, uh, be passed on to your, your offspring um, in, in many cases. Um, and so, you know, um, fast forward Friday, no, actually fast forward Wednesday, um, almost certain, you know, um, Wednesday evening, one of my doctors told me, you know, it's like, you know, how's McGrew doing? Any news yet? You know, any news? Because you're really at the mercy of, of gift of life and, you know, you're your ranking, um, your your listing uh, on the the wait list, and you're you're just waiting. And um, then you know uh, started to receive um, um, offers, and uh, you know um, my doctor told me that you know uh, we you know been made aware that there's a really strong heart and kidney available. Uh, for you. And I remember on that Friday evening, um, you know, uh, being taken down to the operating, to the OR operating room and, um, you know, lying on the table, uh, still conscious enough that I could hear the call that verified, physically verified that the gifted organs that I would receive were good. So, you know, you get the first call that, you know, yeah, we have these um, gifted organs available for one of, um, you know, your your um, uh, waiting transplantees. And, you know, when the call comes in that, you know, um, the doctor has had an opportunity to see them and that it's a go start prepping for surgery, like, wow, the, those were the last words I remember yeah. hearing. And then, um, you know, when I regain consciousness, all of the typical tubing um, that's, you know, in your body and everything helping you to breathe. And, um, uh, so immediately when I became conscious, uh, I was like, you know, trying to um, uh, make eye contact with the nurse, like say, yeah, yeah, I'm like, you know, chewing, like it yeah. really come out now. For sure. Um, uh, because you're... Um, uh, you don't have use of your hands. You know, your hands are restricted. Um, and so it, I want to say it may have been two days before it was removed after I regained consciousness. And as soon as that happened, 
Um, a little later, I was um, on a video call with my mom, and she was in complete awe yeah. that we were talking and via video call. And I was like, you know, mom, everything was a success. And um, I told you. Oh, happy uh, for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. I, I That story is such a beautiful story. I, I, I didn't know the full story like that. Um, thank, thank you for sharing. I'm so glad that um, everything worked out and was healthy. I, I do have a couple of questions. Do you remember or was there like what was your last thought or prayer bef- as you as you were sitting on that table when you heard, OK, they're good? Yeah. Um, you know, my thought was the organs are good and I'm in the most capable hands spiritually and physically. Um, you know, that was that was my thought. Yeah. And that was like, you know, um, you know, God has brought me this far. Yeah. Uh, I know he wouldn't leave me um, here. He's going to complete this work. And uh, my story will be one that serves as a source of encouragement and inspiration uh, to others. Yeah. What does it feel? You know, we we um, I, I have a gratitude journal and I write, you know, one thing I'm grateful for at the end of every night. And I think a lot of people more so now, especially since COVID, you know, um, are, are grateful and, and take a moment to, to connect with gratitude. Yeah. The gratitude of someone else's kidney and heart that is a match for you. I mean, I, I can't comprehend how grateful you must be. Um, were you able to do you find out whose heart and kidneys they are, or is there any, you know, how do you, how do you connect or how do you say thank you for that? Yeah. Um, so I will just preface my response by saying that this is still the most emotional part yeah. of my miracle. It is thinking um, reflecting, um, centering gratitude yeah. and the fact that my life would be no more uh, if it weren't for the generosity of someone who is, you know, passed on. Right. Um, but thought enough of how his life could impact humanity and me personally right. um, when he was no longer here on, on earth. Right. Um, I get emotional about it. I have all right. of the information I need to reach out to his family, and I'm going to do that um, this month. The reason yeah. I have taken this time, um, uh, you know, just to reflect and, um, you know, try to think about what I could possibly say. Yeah. To I, understand. I get that. And I also thought it was only respectful that they have at least a year to grieve. Yeah, I, before uh, they from me. It's so be- it's so beautiful. I um, uh, that's uh, I I I know someone who had a bone marrow transplant, and um, the story, the quick summary story, and I'm getting some of the details wrong. Is a very young girl in New York did it on a whim, you know. And she happened to be a match for someone, you know, and this this woman was in, I think, her 50s or maybe early 60s. Mm-hmm. And it was a match. And after everything, kind of same thing, some time passed. And then when they were emotionally ready to reach out, they did and um, flew to New York and uh, and met her and just, you know, said it was the most beautiful moments, um, you know, because this girl gave gave her life gave her life. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I don't know the name of that person, but I'm sending out, you know, prayers to that person's family and, and, yeah. you know, and good thoughts and, and gratitude. Um, I think it's, it's amazing. Um, so what, what are some of the lessons that you're, that you pull from, you know, these life experiences that you bring mm-hmm. into today? Cause you already have such wisdom and such a positive mindset but where have your where have certain maybe um, lessons elevated, you know, based on what you've been through the last year and a half, two years? Yeah, yeah, thought about this uh, a great deal. I think it's important to 
um, accentuate the positive things that are uh, already present in your life. Uh, it's easy to sort of name all of the things that you wish you had. Um, and that's, that's normal. We, yeah. we all desire um, things. We all have goals and aspirations. But I think if you want to get to those things that you desire, um, they will come quicker than you realize if you practice gratitude. Mm -hmm. Giving and receiving gratitude. What I know for certain, John, is gratitude invites more. Yeah, it, it, it almost, it, it, you know, one way I describe it, it brings you, it, it, it puts you before this open door. Yeah. And the more that you say thank you, um, the more that you appreciate all that you have, including, you know, family, friends, people who care deeply about you, meaningful relationship, yeah. you know, means to provide for your family, just having sanity of mind, the activity of your limbs. Yeah. You know, that everything uh, is a gift. It is yeah. truly a gift. Yeah. It is truly a gift. Um, let me ask, let me I'm ask, more grateful. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm more grateful for sure. Yeah. Um, let, let me ask you this, um, Marcus. You know, it's, it's so interesting because you have chosen a career path that seems very in alignment with who you are, your soul. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it seems personal. It's business, but it seems very personal. Mm -hmm. uh, to your heart as well. And here you are in a, in a business and in a world where you give, right? You give mm -hmm. to, if we just go back to, um, you know, kind of what we, what we started talking about, um, you know, you basically give to get people to a higher ground in life. Mm -hmm. And so were you able through your life to receive? Because if you were, or if you weren't, you really had no choice to receive at this stage, at, at the stage of November 20th or November, 2020. Yeah. What did I, that teach you? What did that teach you about receiving? Cause I think it's easy to give hard to receive, yeah. at least, you know, for Mo, for me. It's still, so, you know, um, the double organ transplants were uh, a very different situation. I needed them to continue um, having a, a high quality of life. Right. So there weren't many options. In that case, I still struggle with receiving. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I prefer to give than receive any day. Yeah. Um, and I think for givers uh, who are, are listening, watching, I think this will resonate with them because they're um, it's, it's more than a rush. It's, it's, it's more than, you know, feeling positive sensations. I think when you give, you actually understand um, what it really means to be grateful. Yeah. What, what it really means to be grateful. The fact that you have a surplus and abundance that you can offer to others, uh, in, in my opinion, guarantees that you will always have overflow and more than enough to share with others. Yeah. And there are some uh, givers who are not yet at the point in their lives where there's an overflow of resources, um, all, all types of resources, but they are certain to come because they are givers and right. they're givers for all of the right reasons. Yeah. They're not looking for um, a big announcement, a pat on the back. They do it because it is, it is who they are. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, this has been a great talk. This has been a great talk. Um, you know, as, as you talk about, you know, just how you were raised, um, your family, um, you know, sitting around, you know, the, uh, the breakfast table, um, 35 first cousins, um, you know, all, all of, all of that. How does all of that continue to fuel your giving in this next chapter of your life, mm -hmm. along with 
the current gratitude of where you've been the last couple of years, right? Yeah. Now, so you're going to be, how old are you? I'm 46. So you're 46 and now you're starting this next chapter moving from Detroit to California. So how, who, what's, what does this next chapter, how would you define this next chapter of your life? If you had to define it in a word. The next chapter of my life, um, well, I would say the the word is 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 giving, but let me just add a little context there. Um, it will be giving more of myself. Yeah. So I want to share my story in in um, in in several mediums. Um, so that that is one thing that I'm I'm definitely going to do. I already have a lot of thoughts about how I want to uh, deliver my story, um, and I just want to share this one thing really, really briefly. Yeah, so. Perfect. I, um, at some point, is still in the very preliminary stages, will launch a life coaching um, practice. And my niche market is going to be people who most can, uh, people who are considered strong by most um, and neglected uh, in some ways because uh, it's easy to think, they don't need anything because of the material things that they possess, the, yeah. the um, positions they hold, um, the power they they wield at, at any given point. But they also need um, someone yeah. to listen and to be uh, a resource to them. And so that will be uh, my niche and it will yeah. be um, by um, referral only. And uh, of course, extremely confidential. So uh, really looking forward to that and yeah. it's continuing to give. I love it. I love it. Um, all right, a couple a couple last questions. Finish, yeah. finish, um, finish this sentence for me. Um, somebody who needs, uh, somebody who's stuck in a negative mindset needs to, needs to learn and unlearn what, let me do it this way, needs to learn that there is a way out and needs to unlearn the many things that has them stuck. I love it. One way, finish this sentence, one way someone can become a better listener is to? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, you must have been on my Zoom meeting last night. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, is to consider how much um, better your life would be by um, hearing and getting to know the, perspective, the, the perspectives of, of many. And my last question. For those who are listening to this at any time or forwarding it to someone who has been in a, um, in this case, a medical situation like you have been, um, one thing someone who has lost hope or on the verge of losing hope can do to regain hope is? Change your belief system. Yeah. Yeah, change your belief system. Well said. Marcus, I, I really appreciate your time um, and you taking time to share your story about mindset and philanthropy and the importance of family and community and the importance of listening and uh, what your parents taught you about work ethic and um, and to just never have kind of a sick mentality and keep the faith and keep the hope and 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 just um, you know nurturing yourself and always growing and always raising your awareness and just walking your path with um with confidence with courage with integrity um and just a ton of passion and doing what you love and 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 just the importance of um really giving giving and i just i, I wish you all the best in your uh new philanthropic um role in california your life coaching business just everything that you do um continue to stay healthy and be a mentor to uh to everybody who's watching and listening so 
Thank you so much. I'll let you. Any last words or thoughts? Yeah, I want to take a moment to um, speak some really affirming words about you, John. Oh. <laughs> um, your story is amazing. Um, I've been very inspired by your story, and I just want to say out loud that what you're doing is making a profound difference in the lives of people you may never hear from. Yeah. So stay the course, stay positive, keep being an inspiration, keep affirming yourself and others in your circle and uh, continue to soar. Yeah. Continue to soar. Thanks, man. Thanks. I appreciate that, Marcus. It means a lot coming from you. Um, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for Michael Knight. Owner yeah. of Art of Strength, just give him a little plug, right? Yeah, because right. um, he keeps he he's on a mission to keep the world healthy. That guy, yes. he is yes. on the world to keep everybody healthy. Uh, so I I'm grateful that he uh, introduced us uh, through Coffee with John. It was a pleasure. Thank you a ton. Think community. If you want to get in touch with Marcus, Marcus, tell him how to connect with you. So you can find me on Instagram at Marcus McGrew. Um, I'm there. Um, that's where I'd like to refer you because I'm in the process of updating my my profile to talk about all things health and wealth in all its very forms. So please join me there. Thank you. Love it. All right. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Let everybody.